Hello and welcome to another teaching from 119 Ministries. Our ministry believes that the whole Bible is still true and directly related to our lives today. If you'd like to learn more about what we believe and teach, please visit us at testeverything.net. If you enjoy this video, please click the like button and subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscribe button below. We hope you enjoy studying and testing the following teaching. You know the feeling when you're talking to someone about your passion and you can tell they don't share that passion? It's not a great feeling, is it? Do you usually continue the discussion and go further in depth? Probably not, or at least not very often. Unfortunately, too many times that is exactly what we do when we are new to the faith, whether it's being new to applying the Hebrew culture and context of our faith, commonly known as Hebrew roots, or new to mainstream Christianity. We want so much to tell everyone what we've learned that we just start talking and we don't stop. Whether you're new to Torah or have been in it for a while, you may experience a lot of hostility toward you or what you have to say when talking to others about the Torah. Unfortunately, it's not an uncommon reaction and it isn't pleasant to go through. In order to help you navigate your way through conversations about Scripture and hopefully help you to mitigate at least some of the negative responses you may receive, we're putting together this video. We want to take this time to share some of what we have learned through our own individual experiences and as a ministry. As with everything in life, there are times when it's good to have conversations, but it's also important to recognize when not to or how not to. For those further along in their journey, we'd also recommend our video, How to Share the Truth. We are also going to look at how our attitudes, actions, and words play a huge part in how others respond to what we have to say. We have broken this teaching down into several broad sections made up of smaller parts. How to talk Torah when you're new. How not to bully others with your attitude, words, and actions, respectively. So let's get started. How to talk Torah when you're new. Remember the feeling when you walk into a store and get bombarded with salespeople? Or how it feels to have someone working so hard to show you all of the benefits of a product? Think of how those discussions often go how they try to convince you their product is so much better than what you already have. If you're like a lot of us, you probably become annoyed and less interested by the moment in what they have to say. Maybe you even begin to feel hostile towards them and negative about what they're hawking. Nobody wants to be that salesperson, especially when it comes to discussing something as important as Scripture and their eternity. Unfortunately, that's a reality many of us have experienced when we are new to this walk or trying to share the truth of Torah with someone else. So how do we avoid this? To talk Torah or not. To be quite plain, we don't believe in-depth discussions about walking out the Torah with those who are against it should even be occurring at an early time in your walk. We realize you simply want to share the truth and be a light, but without a firm foundation and maturity in the word, what you say may fall on deaf ears. If this happens often enough, especially with the same person, then you may become more like a clanging symbol, like Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 13 when discussing speaking in tongues without love. We believe that a good model for our behavior lies in the Father's instructions relating to the fruit trees in the land found in Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19, 23-25 When you come into the land and plant any kind of tree for food, then you shall regard its fruit as forbidden. Three years it shall be forbidden to you. It must not be eaten, and in the fourth year all its fruit shall be holy, an offering of praise to Yahweh. But in the fifth year you may eat of its fruit, to increase its yield for you. I am Yahweh your God. The main point we are pulling out here is in verse 25. We are not to eat the fruit of a tree until it has reached a certain degree of maturity. It's fifth year. It is our experience that until a person has at least three years of focused maturation in the Word of God, especially the Torah if they're new to studying it in its cultural context, that it's best to avoid sharing everything they are learning. For more on this, please see our blog titled Fruit Trees and You. With that in mind, and before we really get into this teaching, we want to make something clear to those who are new to this walk. When you're first beginning this journey, studying scripture from a Hebraic perspective, it's all very exciting, and there is so much to learn, so many different voices and opinions you will hear. In fact, there's so much, it can be quite overwhelming. 
For this reason, it is vitally important to be a Berean and test everything to the word for yourself. Yes, this includes not listening to us at 119. We are only human and fallible as well. It is so important to spend time alone in the word first. Work hard to generate your own conclusions on things with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. If possible, get connected with like-minded believers in your area to discuss things with, but remember, we all only know in part. Do not rely heavily on other people, be they friends, scholars, teachers, or ministries, especially at first, even though it's easier and seems natural. 119 Ministries is not your authority, nor is any other human teacher or ministry. Only the Word of God is your authority. If you are new and seek to learn our perspective, after you have looked into things on your own, we do offer and recommend you sign up for our free Hebrew Roots 101 email program found in the Torah Training Center on the website. As previously stated, we are still human and may not be correct in everything. No one is. Please test everything you hear, whether it be from us or any other source, to the Word of God. Stand ready to reject man's understandings if they don't line up with what's in our Father's Holy Word. We are even told to test the spirits, so keep that in mind as well if you feel you are hearing from a spirit, but what you're hearing contradicts anything in Scripture. Now let's get into the topic at hand, talking Torah, if you must. If you still choose to enter into a discussion about following Torah, or you are forced into one, you'll find no shortage of people ready and happy to challenge you in a vast array of topics. They may use scripture to tear you down and build themselves up. If you aren't able to provide sufficient answers to defend your position or cause them to question their own understandings, these conversations can backfire badly. Without the proper maturity level and foundation in the Torah yourself, you may find yourself floundering, shocked, and possibly offended. It is for reasons like these and others that we recommend not talking Torah with anyone until you're well grounded in the word and truth of the Torah. However, once people learn that you are no longer following a mainstream doctrine, even if it's just changing your diet or observing a Friday night to Saturday night Sabbath, it is almost inevitable that you will be pulled into a discussion at one time or another. In those cases, what do you do? Run. Okay, not really, but really. Do your best to avoid going too deep into things you don't have a firm grasp on. This is why apologetics is so important to our faith. The point of apologetics is to be able to defend what you believe, just like Peter mentions in 1 Peter 3.15. For more on the importance of apologetics, please see our video titled, Why Apologetics Matters. Back to the point we were making. It's not wise and is often unfruitful to engage in a discussion about your beliefs when you aren't firmly rooted in them and are not yet equipped to defend your understanding of Scripture. Instead of getting yourself caught in a difficult conversation, we have found there is greater wisdom in letting the other person talk. Then thank them for the information and let them know you want to study it out more. Afterward, go home and do just that. Test what they've said to the pure Word of God and see what you find. We aren't saying go back to them and tell them they were right or wrong. Simply pray and meditate on it. Discern the truth through your study with the Father and apply what needs applied to your life. When that strategy doesn't work and you feel that you have no choice but to engage in a deeper discussion, this should almost never happen, there is something you need to remember. When sharing the truth with anyone, it is not up to you to convince them of anything. You cannot convince them of the truth. It is not your job. It's not something you are even capable of, at least not at the heart level. This is the job of the Father through the Holy Spirit. Your words should simply point them to the Word and bring life, not death, to others. Build them up. Don't tear them down. Remember, there is only one authority, the Word of God. For more on bringing life and death to others, please see our blog, Are We Speaking Life or Death? So what should you do when you are caught in a conversation about your faith? We have found four things we believe to be key to helping you come out of them without a damaged relationship. First, examine yourself, both your attitude and your approach. More on those in a little bit. Secondly, keep in mind Matthew 7, 6. Do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. In many cases, the other person may not yet be ready to hear what you have to say, and that's okay. Because of this, you don't need to spend a lot of your time discussing it, especially if they are closed or hostile toward your perspective. 
we don't wish for anyone to go through that, which is why, again, we recommend avoiding those types of situations if at all possible. When they are necessary, end them quickly. You can plant a seed for the father to water and nurture, but that doesn't mean you have to go into great depth or remain in a hostile discussion. Third, redirect to common ground and the redeeming work of Messiah that you both already agree upon. This helps to remind them that you are on the same side. Finally, whether you're new to studying and walking out the Hebraic culture and context of your faith or not, keep your eyes focused on Yahweh and His Word. Here are a couple of quick verses to help you check yourself. 1 Corinthians 4.12 We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. Are you doing that? Here's what Yeshua did and why He is to be the example. 1 Peter 2.21-23 to this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Now let's move into the real meat of this video, the how not to bully others section mentioned earlier. We're going to start by examining attitudes. How not to bully others with your attitude. Think back to times when you have tried to talk to your loved ones about applying Torah in your life. Some may be receptive while others may refuse to even talk about the subject, or in some cases, become hostile, showing you a side of them you would have never thought existed. Sometimes it seems like the more you try to show people the truth of Scripture, the more hostile they become. Unfortunately, this isn't an experience unique to you. On the other hand, it's also not uncommon for people in Torah to be called a bully, a Bible thumper, a Torah tyrant, or a Torah terrorist, even when they're no longer new. This can happen whether someone is truly being one or not. It doesn't always have to be that way, though. Your approach may be the issue. The attitude you take or project affects everything about your approach, which is why we are starting here. Your attitude impacts your actions and your words. If you don't have the right attitude to begin with, there is rarely anything good that can come of the conversation. Perhaps the most important thing you need to keep in mind when sharing the applicability of Torah with others is that they are loved by God, and therefore you need to show them love and be respectful. Keeping this in mind will help you maintain the proper loving perspective. You cannot show them love if your words and actions are born out of an unloving attitude. Remember, anytime you are discussing scripture or someone knows you are a believer, you are a representative of the Father. Act accordingly or risk slinging mud on your Creator. Perspectives and Attitudes In order to talk about attitudes, we must first understand perspectives. A person's perspective is the lens through which they see the world. It's with this lens that we interpret events and words. This lens is shaped by our experiences and how we choose to interpret them. Your attitude is directly tied to your perspective. When someone receives the understanding that the Torah applies to them today, there is usually a gamut of emotions that go through them. These emotions can range from joy, love, and thankfulness because of the truth, to anger and distrust because they feel they have been deceived. The first three emotions, joy, love, and thankfulness, are obviously good and are the ones we should operate out of when speaking with others. Unfortunately, anger and distrust may taint our views on our past including the time we spent in mainstream Christianity. When we live in our anger and feelings of betrayal, we become a poor witness to others. This is why it is vital that we speak out of a place of sincere love for our neighbor. Love must be reflected in our choice of words and our tone, or else, as Paul said, we become like a noisy gong. The most important part of our conversation with others is not our own intent, but rather how our words are received by the individual we are speaking with. This is true whether you are the one speaking the words or the one hearing them. Our intentions color what we hear or receive from others, just as much as they affect what we say. You choose your perspective, and thus you choose your attitude. Your attitude then dictates your outward behavior. Your outward behavior includes your tone, the words you use, and how you act. Are you striving to communicate truth with love or to prove a point? Are you trying to convince someone of some great truth that you found as opposed to the truth that they know? Are you having a discussion to share or to be right? It's vital that our communication has the goal of sharing, not rebuking. 
Sharing truth in love requires us to be sensitive to our listener, taking care not to press or bully them beyond what they are receptive to. Remember, you and your beliefs are not the focus of the word. Love is. Yahweh is love, 1 John 4, 8. You are to be a vehicle of that love, being a light and taking it to the world, Matthew 5, 14 through 16. People should be drawn to the Father through your example, your light, not repulsed by it. If you are not being a light, you might be acting as a wedge, a stumbling block because of your attitude, actions, or words. If we claim to be children of God, then our lives need to reflect Him and His love. People should see Him in us. How do they do that? Through our fruit. The fruit of the Spirit of God is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It is with this fruit that you should approach every conversation with your loved ones. When you do, you will be loving your neighbor. Your goal should never be to convince someone that their beliefs are wrong or that you are right. Rather than striving to prove anything, simply share what you are learning. But, and this is important, only share if they are open to it. If a person isn't open to what you have to say, then stop talking about it. Messiah said not to cast your pearls before swine. Anyone who isn't truly open to what you have to say isn't going to hear what you're saying, even if you have the best attitude. So let's take a look at a couple of examples of how your attitude can affect your approach. Some examples. There is a difference between sharing something exciting that you have learned and trying to prove how everything someone has learned is wrong, that you somehow now have the monopoly on truth. For example, we could say this. Did you know that we've been lied to for years by our pastor at church and that everything we've been taught is wrong? We need to be following the law because that's what Jesus did. Not only that, but Christmas and Easter are actually pagan false god worship days. I don't understand it all yet, but I've been testing all of my old beliefs using a Hebrew perspective, and they're almost all wrong. You should start testing everything, too. It's so clear that celebrating Christmas and Easter is wrong when you look at their pagan roots. While I may not know everything, I do know a lot of what I've been taught isn't right. If you just look at the Bible through its Hebrew culture, you will see the same thing. If you really want to love God, then you need to stop celebrating Easter and Christmas. Stop eating pork and shellfish and just do what the Bible says. If you don't do that, then you don't really love God and you're just following man-made things. Obey the law of God. It's so freeing. Or you could say, hey, I've been studying the Bible and trying to keep the Hebrew culture and context in mind. It's really helped me to understand the Bible in a way I never thought possible. I've heard some things that really made me think and had me excited about reading the Bible again. I've heard that obeying the law of God is actually how we show him that we love him. I'd never heard that before or given it any thought. I'm even starting to think that what I thought were Jewish holidays like Passover and Unleavened Bread aren't just for the Jews. It's actually kind of cool to think that God set up holidays for his people to make us different from the rest of the world. Have you ever looked at it that way before? Do you see the differences there? Both times you may be well-intentioned, but your approach is vastly different. Both methods are sharing from your heart, but your intent or perceived intent, and thus your attitude, appears to be quite different. Also notice how some of the most divisive topics aren't brought up, such as the dietary instructions or calling Easter and Christmas pagan in the second example. Which do you think would receive a more favorable response and allow for a positive, profitable conversation? The first one is full of exuberance and zeal for what you may believe to be truth. You're excited and want everyone to see the same things you do, but at what cost? You may have just come across as being a bully, pushy, arrogant, like you are the only one to have all of the answers and are therefore judging them. In their eyes, you may appear to have an agenda, an intent beyond simply sharing. Without realizing it, you may be attacking your loved one's personal beliefs, which causes them to get defensive. At that point, what response does an individual usually have? A negative or a positive one? If it continues, do you think they'll come around or will they become increasingly hostile? The second example is simply sharing some things being learned and inviting them into a discussion. One is full of well-intentioned arrogance, while the other has humility, gentleness, and remains at peace. One has the fruit of the Spirit, the other does not. In order to make sure you have the proper attitude when speaking to someone about the Torah, first ask yourself these questions in this order.
Number one, what is my motivation behind having this conversation? What am I trying to achieve? Number two, can I maintain a calm, peaceful, and loving attitude if they become hostile and disagree with me? And number three, what is my knowledge level on the subject? Do I just feel something isn't true? Or can I correctly and fully explain how and where the misunderstanding happens in a loving manner and encourage them to seek the Father on it themselves? How you honestly answer these questions will determine whether or not you should move forward in a conversation. You may even need to ask yourself these questions before you respond to someone while in the midst of a conversation in order to help you maintain the proper attitude. If you have to do this in the midst of a discussion, ask yourself an additional question or two such as, what is this person responding or reacting to? Was it something I said or maybe how I said it? Communicating peacefully without pushing away those you love is not about how convincing your argument is or even how wrong they may be in your eyes. One really has nothing to do with the other. Communicating with love is about who you are as a representative of the Most High and how you are communicating His love and truth with others. Sometimes you may know all the right words to say, yet you may come across with the wrong attitude or tone. When that happens, the person will typically reject what is being said, at least for the moment. What's really sad is that they could have been on the verge of really getting it, but because of how it was communicated, they may reject your message instead. When people are faced with an inappropriate attitude, perceived or otherwise, they will start to put up a fence to end the hostility they are feeling. If this happens, stop and look for an opportunity to learn something about how to better communicate with love. Even if you do mess up one interaction that isn't the end of the world, you may still have planted a seed for Yahweh to water. Now that we've covered the basics of our attitudes when communicating, let's move on to how we can avoid becoming bullies with our words. How not to bully others with your words. So far, we've covered how you need to be mature, three to five years mature, in the faith before you really start sharing the Torah and discipling others and how to walk it out. We've also looked at how our attitudes can turn someone away from the truth, closing their ears so that they do not hear what we are trying to say. In this section, we'll look at how, if we aren't careful, we can bully others regarding following Torah with our words. We do this by not taking the other person into consideration first. When we don't consider others, we make the conversation all about us and our own perspective. We behave in a selfish manner. It's imperative that we take the focus off of ourselves and put it on the Word, meeting people where they are at. Considering Others First Among the best ways to take others into consideration is to first ask yourself several questions. If you aren't certain of the answers before you begin the conversation, then you need to tread very carefully and get the answers as soon as you can. You should recognize some of these from the previous section. Number one, what is your point or purpose in having the discussion? This may be the most important question as it sets your tone, defines your perspective, and reveals your attitude. Ask yourself, why do I want to tell people about this topic and what am I trying to accomplish? With the wrong motivation, you are more likely to do harm than good. If your goal is to convince someone or even just show them how their beliefs are wrong and misguided, then you need to stop. Do not go forward as this is the wrong motivation. If you come into a conversation with any motive other than love, then you have already taken the wrong route and risk damaging your relationship, losing credibility with the person, and poorly representing the Father. The motivation you have will directly impact your word choices and how you perceive the listener's reactions and responses to what you say. That leads us to the second question. Can you maintain a calm, peace, and loving attitude if they become hostile and disagree with you. If you are unable to keep yourself from getting riled up when in a heated argument, then we advise against entertaining discussions. Now, we aren't talking about a good-natured heated debate. There is nothing wrong with heated conversations and iron sharpening iron. But if you become emotionally charged during the discussion, it moves from being a sharing of ideas to a conversation where you make the other person an opponent, an argument to win. Discussions relating to deep-seated beliefs, such as religion or other objects and subjects of the faith, often inflame people's passions. Too often, tempers flare and the words become both hostile and defensive. You may take offense and you may offend them. If someone is offended by the word, that is one thing. But if they become offended because of your word choices or how you're saying them, that's something else entirely. In these situations, neither side wins. 
For more on how to handle when you take offense, please see our teaching titled, It's a Matter of Self-Offense. When someone becomes offended, all sorts of trouble can begin brewing in a discussion. Your word choices may become more aggressive or antagonistic. Your tone can become sharper or condescending, and your body language can be construed as hostile. The person you are talking to is not your enemy. But even if they were, you're supposed to show love to them anyway. Don't put yourself into a situation where you know that your negative emotions will be easily triggered if you don't know how to handle yourself in those moments. The person you're talking to will pick up on those cues and will likely respond in kind or walk away with a bad taste in their mouth about you and potentially the Bible. Don't let yourself become a stumbling block because you're unable to exercise self-control. If your intentions are pure and you can master your emotions and responses, then there's something else you need to ask yourself. Number three, what is your knowledge level on a subject? Do you just know something isn't true? Or do you have the explanation of how and where the misunderstanding occurs? We want to start off by saying that it's okay if you don't know an answer to a question when someone challenges you on something. It's an opportunity to learn. Don't try to fake an answer. You're more likely to simply make yourself look foolish and lose credibility with the person. If you don't know something, humbly admit it, and then spend the time to learn about it when you have the chance. Doing so will help better equip you in the area of apologetics. Apologetics is defending your faith. It's an important part of every believer's life. Our ministry is primarily an apologetics ministry that focuses on helping believers understand the Torah, how it still applies to their lives, and why they believe it. Practicing apologetics isn't just something for scholars, pastors, or academics to do. It is something we are called to do as members of the body. We are to be able to defend what we believe when having discussions with others. 1 Peter 3.15 but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. For more on the importance of apologetics, please see our video, Why Apologetics Matters. With that said, it's always dangerous to get into a conversation, debate, or argument with someone relating to Scripture if you don't have a strong foundation and depth of knowledge on the topic. It's one thing to have a general knowledge, but the discussions we're talking about often go deeper. In these discussions, it is most beneficial for you to possess a deep knowledge of the topic and be able to communicate it clearly and in multiple ways. If you can't do that, then just don't have the discussion yet. You don't want your lack of knowledge to allow you to get flustered or defensive when they challenge you with something, and they will. When we get flustered, it's easy for us to deflect or to use a snide remark to mask our embarrassment in that moment. Remember, our word choices and tones remain vitally important. On the flip side, sometimes people have so much knowledge, or think they do, that they let it go to their heads and they become haughty or arrogant, or even have an unteachable spirit. This, again, causes their words, tone, and actions to be hostile and unloving, behaviors unbecoming of the Father whom they are representing. When someone has a lot of knowledge, or perceived knowledge, it can be all too easy to be dismissive and derisive. We live in a world that loves snarky comments and a sharp wit. While using those in a discussion or debate may appear amusing at the time, it's damaging to our reputation, our example, and worse, the reputation of Yahweh. If his people act like that, why would anyone want to draw near to him or to follow his Torah? Number four, do they believe the whole word of God is true? If the person you are speaking with does not already believe the whole word of God to be true, then things are likely going to be very difficult for you. If they only believe the New Testament applies, then you may struggle making your point and they are less likely to be open to what you have to say. In these types of discussions, it is best to keep on common ground and avoid arguments or debates about things like the calendar, which name they use, their diet, etc. Avoid the more divisive topics and let the Father provide you with opportunities to bring things up in a way that is loving. Number five, are they a deeply religious individual with strongly held beliefs? When someone is deeply religious or very zealous about their beliefs, your ability to offend them increases exponentially. The closer held a specific belief is to someone, the less open they are to discussing it. If you challenge a deeply held belief, you may quickly find the person closes themselves off to you and what you have to say. Additionally, and perhaps more importantly, they are more likely to feel that you are attacking them personally. After all, 
What are we as people other than the summation of our beliefs? Tread very carefully in discussions with such people. We strongly recommend you avoid their sensitive subjects unless they actually come to you seeking your thoughts. You must remember, it is neither kind nor loving to bluntly tell them how they are wrong and what or how they believe. Let us repeat that. It is neither kind nor loving to tell someone that they are wrong or that their beliefs are wrong in a manner that lacks compassion. Yes, we can communicate truth and love, but it's better to give them something to think about than to simply say they are wrong. Sure, sometimes people prefer a straightforward approach, but in general, that is not the way you should speak to people. Save the harsher approach for those whom you know personally and know they will appreciate and respond positively to it. You could ask them challenging questions or something of that nature. For some examples of these types of questions, we recommend our short video, The Unanswerable Questions. When you use a blunt, accusatory approach, the person is automatically put into defense mode and you're on the attack. We shouldn't be attacking the brethren in the body of Messiah. These people are not your enemy. They're not even your opponent. So you don't get to treat them as if they are. Even if your loved ones are deceived or in error about something, as we all are about some things, you do not get to go and point out everything they are wrong about. We all only know in part and need to remember the words of Messiah. Matthew 7.5 First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. There is no love in attacking someone's belief. Let's be clear. We aren't talking about if someone is actively, willfully sinning, such as committing adultery. We're talking about someone whom the Father hasn't revealed his truth to yet. Yes, it's a sin to break the law of God, but you won't win someone over with the truth if you come at them using Scripture like a club and no love. There's no room to be a Torah terrorist or even a Bible thumper in your walk. That isn't loving your neighbor. The word is not a club or sword to be wielded against your brothers and sisters. It's a weapon to fight against the adversary in the spiritual realm. Ephesians 6.12 For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Nine times out of ten, someone who is approached in a way that makes them feel attacked is not going to accept what you have to say. You don't get to convict them of anything. The Holy Spirit will do that. You only get to love them. Number six, is the individual open to other perspectives and willing to test their own beliefs? Are they seeking? This may actually be the second most important question of all. Unless a person is actively seeking the truth, regardless of what they find, they are unlikely to accept anything you have to say. There is a reason Scripture tells us that if we seek, we will find. The inverse is also true. If we are not seeking the Father and His truths, we will not find them. Not only will we not find them, but we are also less likely to be open to them if they are presented to us. We don't recommend engaging in discussions about the Torah with someone who is not seeking truth in whatever form it may come. Yes, you may plant a seed in passing, giving them something to think about, but the conversation may not be fruitful and is risky. We would strongly recommend against actually engaging in a discussion with them about how the Torah still applies today. At best, it will be unfruitful in that moment. At worst, offense is taken and relationships are destroyed. About your words. Did you notice how three of the six questions are about you? This is because if you are not in the right place with the right motivation, the correct attitude, and the proper level of maturity, things will only be more difficult. In these situations, your frustration is likely to skyrocket and your words may end up being unkind and unloving if you face resistance. It's unlikely that much good will come out of discussions when neither you nor the other individual are in the right place. More likely is that one or both of you will come away feeling personally attacked and negative about the discussion. There is a reason we are warned about both our words and our tongues. James 1.26 If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Proverbs 15.4 A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Proverbs 18.21 Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Ephesians 4.29 let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Proverbs 12:18. There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. 
in Matthew 12, 36. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. Your words are powerful and are not something to be taken lightly. They can be a blessing or they can wound deeply, leaving someone feeling cursed. Often, conversations with loved ones about the Torah start out with good intentions. However, when we start to encounter resistance to what we say and believe, the fruits of the Spirit begin to disappear, particularly when the other person becomes antagonistic. The same is true of our loved ones. They may start out open and willing to listen, but if they sense or start to see anything but pure, unadulterated love from you, they will often begin to react with hostility. This begins a vicious cycle of negativity with each interaction elevating above the one before. Until pretty soon, both sides are angry, aggressive, and defensive of their own beliefs. No iron sharpening happens here. Typically, something breaks first. If you have had or are having discussions like this, you need to shift your perspective. It will change your attitude towards them. We cannot communicate and show the love of the Creator for that individual when our own perspective sees them as the opposition. Before we ever let that fire of hostility ignite within us, we need to stop, drop, and roll in a different direction. Instead of reacting to what our loved ones are saying, we need to respond out of love. For more on responding instead of reacting, please see our blog titled, React or Respond. Finally, before we conclude our discussion on words, we want to address one more related topic. While we feel the information in this video is good for anyone at any stage in their walk, it has been primarily geared toward those newer to the walking out of the Torah. We have also been largely using the perspective that these conversations are happening face-to-face -face or with someone you know personally. This leaves out an important application of these principles. As you know, we now live in an age where it's more common to communicate with someone through a device than in person. When having discussions with someone using an online medium such as Facebook, Twitter, Quora, Reddit, or other social networking platforms, it's just as important, if not more, to keep these principles in mind and apply them. Over the years, we have seen or taken part in thousands of conversations on different social media platforms. It likely comes as no surprise for you to hear that many, many people communicate without love or kindness from behind their screens. Sadly, many of those people claim to follow, serve, and thus represent Yahweh, the same creator of the universe. Here is a small sample of examples illustrating unloving behavior by people from either side of discussions posted on the 119 Facebook page. Another unfortunate truth is that there are so many Christians who get their feelings hurt so very quickly. Please don't defend them. They need to grow up. It was not related. It was an automatic post. Your heart is self-righteous. Get over yourself. Contrary to what churchianity has brainwashed the masses with, these reprobates are literally a waste of time. So-called Christians. There is nothing loving in the above statements. People who speak like that will turn others away. They won't be able to win anyone for Yahweh unless He makes a miracle happen. Throwing out accusations, slander, or using language like churchianity or so-called Christians shows a distinct lack of love for your neighbor. Instead of showing our Father's love, it shows arrogance, a proud heart, and a lack of love and compassion for someone whom the Father hasn't revealed the same understanding to. It's not unusual to hear people defend behaviors like those in the examples by saying that they're just being like the Messiah. They say things like, Jesus called the Pharisees snakes and vipers, children of the adversary. He braided a whip and overturned tables in the market. I'm just following his example. The following quote was taken from our Facebook page when someone lamented over how bad and unkind the comments had become. Yeshua flipped over tables, cracked a whip, and yelled at those he disagreed with. There's a real problem with behaving like that, though not the least of which is, no one else is the Messiah, the Son of the Most High. No other human has his perfect righteous judgment and perfected heart or his perfect love. It's rare that anyone could possibly claim to have the same pure righteous anger Yeshua felt at various times. While yes, Yeshua is our example on how to live, that doesn't mean we've arrived and can righteously emulate everything he did. In fact, he instructed us to handle things differently. In Matthew 5, during the Sermon on the Mount, he tells us to turn the other cheek, to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. In Matthew 10, he sends out the disciples and tells them that if someone doesn't receive them or listen to their words, to shake off the dust when they leave. He never tells us to argue, berate, belittle, or use scripture to abuse someone into accepting him. 
In fact, he gives us a warning that says just the opposite. Matthew 5.22 But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. The Apostle Paul gives us similar directions. Galatians 5, 13 through 15. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. And verse 26. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. When we're behind our screens, it's really easy to let our sinful flesh rise up, take offense, and use our words to tear others down. It's so simple to toss a verbal grenade, stir up a bunch of trouble, and then log off, not giving things another thought. It seems like we don't have to take any accountability for our actions, as if we don't think it's our problem if we've caused strife or division among the brethren. Yahweh hates such behaviors. Proverbs 6, 16 and 19. There are six things that Yahweh hates seven that are an abomination to him, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among his brothers. Behaving in the unkind and unloving ways mentioned earlier resembles sin and the fruits of the flesh rather than the fruits of the Spirit. They are not actions most of us would ever take in person. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. But that isn't what we are called to do. That isn't loving our neighbor. If you're interacting with people online, whatever the platform, keep in mind that the person on the other side was created by your Heavenly Father, and you are called to show them love. The Father sees everything and knows your heart in any given moment. Nothing is hidden from him. Remember to show the fruits of the Spirit instead of the works of the flesh. Galatians 5, and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Keep in mind, everything we just said pertaining to social media is just as true for an in-person conversation. It's just easier to get caught up in our flesh when typing words, especially since the other person cannot hear any tone in your voice or see any body language. We need to be very careful at all times how we interact with others, especially when only our words exist for them to gather information from. Now that we've reviewed our attitudes and the words we use, there's one more thing we need to be mindful of. If we want to effectively discuss the scriptures, we have to be careful of our actions. How not to bully others with your actions. The way we approach others is just as important and tied to the attitudes and words we use in our interactions. Let's say that in your discussions, you verify that you have the right attitude. You are communicating with love. You have been careful about which words you choose and the way you use them. Yet despite this, the majority of people are still taking offense and getting defensive when you discuss things with them. The next thing to consider is that maybe there is something in your actions that needs changed. The manner in which you are approaching others may not be what it should be and it could actually be bullying them into following the Torah. Your actions. What we mean by actions isn't necessarily something physical you are doing to them, like invading their personal space. It's possible they are watching you and are seeing some amount of hypocrisy in your life. Your actions are not matching your words. You could be talking about love, but communicating in a forceful, unloving, or inconsiderate manner. The way you are communicating may even be perceived as hostile or aggressive. In general, your actions can include but are not limited to your body language, tone of voice, volume of voice, and how you are projecting your emotions as well as physical activity. What actions? We are not experts by any means, so we've included a few links for you to visit that can help you learn about your body language and the body language of others. They are also included in the transcript of the video on our website for your convenience. Having this knowledge should help you interact with others as you become more mindful of what your body is communicating and how they are responding. In addition to knowing about body language, there is wisdom in refusing to approach some individuals. 
Once someone has already indicated they disagree with your understandings, it is ill-advised for you to push the issue any further. Unfortunately, many people will continue to hound and pursue those who have already said they weren't interested or that they disagreed and weren't open for discussion on the topic. We have heard stories about people in Torah continually bad-mouthing and instigating arguments with others who disagree with them. What an awful reputation to have. How well do you think that reflects on Yahweh? When you try to push your own agenda or beliefs upon someone, you are doing a couple of different things. Number one, you are accomplishing almost nothing more than irritating and angering the other person. Number two, you give others who do share your understanding the bad reputation of being hyper-religious, a Torah Nazi, or a Torah tyrant, among other things. And most importantly, number three, you are giving the Father a bad name and reputation by being a poor witness and representative of who He is and what He desires of His people. If someone disagrees with you, that's fine. Let them disagree. By pursuing someone who doesn't want to hear, you are only leaving a bad taste in their mouth regarding the Torah and others that share your mindset. If they are not interested, then leave them alone and be a good witness until they are ready to listen. All of the above is important, but perhaps the most important actions we take concern our approach, essentially the way we discuss things. For example, if someone is telling you about their plans for Christmas and then ask you what yours are, you should not respond with, We don't have any plans for Christmas because we no longer celebrate pagan false god-worshipping holidays. Saying something like that isn't loving, it lacks compassion, and it can do a few other things. First, it can make it seem like you believe you are too good for them and are putting them beneath you. It's arrogant, as if you're somehow more holy and righteous than they are in your own mind. Secondly, it's disrespectful. They were trying to share their joy with you, but instead you've disregarded their joy and now said that what they do is pagan. In their minds, you're basically accusing them of being pagans, even if they are Christians. Calling them pagan has the connotation of something bad or evil to many people. You've just insulted them and their faith in one fell swoop. And finally, you have shared far too much for the context of the scenario. You could have simply said that you won't be celebrating or that you were going to spend the day at home relaxing with your family and left it there. If they cared enough to know more, they would ask you why or why not. At that point, you could give them a bit more information, as long as you didn't take the same tone the previous statement implied. When we give people unwanted information, it not only falls on deaf ears, but it can actually begin to build a wall between us and those we are speaking with. You may earn the reputation of being hyper-religious. They may start to close themselves off to further discussions with you because of it. The Dangers of Oversharing Sharing too much is easy to do and can be one of the most detrimental things to a discussion. When you share too much, it's likely you have not taken the other person's feelings, intent, or personal spiritual walk into consideration. You have now started to become an aggressor with an agenda to tell them how they are wrong and what they believe they know. Sharing too much can actually derail someone in their walk, or at least provide them a detour from where they should be going. While testing everything is good and should be done, There is an aspect of testing things at the right time that comes into play. To use an example from mainstream Christianity, you wouldn't just take someone who has just learned about the Messiah and then dump them into a deep study about spiritual warfare and make them a prayer warrior, would you? Not typically. It's not that those things are bad, but they may not be ready for it. They may become consumed by the topic and miss out on developing a firm foundation in the Word and the opportunity to gain a deeper understanding of grace, salvation, and faith. In the same way, you shouldn't start a conversation with someone telling them that what they believe is just wrong, or jump into the deeper concepts found in the Torah, including topics like the calendar and the name. You should talk about the areas you already agree on, such as who the Messiah is, how we all benefit from Yahweh's grace, how salvation works, and how we are all one body. As Paul alluded to, we all need milk in the beginning, before we mature enough to be ready for the meat. When we overshare, we tend to start giving meat long before they're ready. Another thing oversharing can do is turn someone off from wanting to discuss things with you because they don't want to listen for as long as you'll speak. If someone asks a simple question about a topic, let's say if 2 plus 2 is 4, and you go into a 10-minute explanation regarding the mechanics of the mathematics behind it and number theory, it's unlikely they will want to ask you about something even more important. Put simply, Oversharing may occur out of a desire to be helpful, 
but if it fails to take the person into account, it becomes all about you and your knowledge. Oversharing or even overexplaining is easy to do. I've been guilty of it myself many times, but we really need to listen to the Holy Spirit about whether we should continue talking and just be aware of other nonverbal cues. To put it in modern vernacular, read the room. Communicating the Torah without pushing away friends and family is about you and your actions just as much as a good meal requires a good cook with knowledge and experience on how to prepare it. You may have the right attitude going into a conversation, but when your actions, your body language, tone, amount of sharing, etc. are all wrong, things are likely to go awry. Think about times this may have happened to you and look for an opportunity to learn something about how you are communicating a message by your actions and not just your words. Conclusion As with most people who come into a new belief system, be it mainstream Christianity, Torah pursuance, etc., it's normal to be excited and want to share it with everyone. Unfortunately, this isn't always the best idea. Sharing the Word of God is less about telling everyone your beliefs and more about living your life following our Messiah's example, walking out your faith. Yahweh will bring you opportunities to share and teach the whole word when both you and the other person are ready. It's about making disciples, which is a change in lifestyle and something only those a little more mature in their faith should undertake. Think about it. Even the apostles didn't go out and tell everyone as soon as Messiah taught them something. They learned from their teacher, sat at his feet, lived their lives with him before they were ready to be sent out. It was for similar reasons that Paul instructed Timothy to choose only elders who were mature in their faith, not simply someone who is new and exuberant. You may have all of the right ideas and a new understanding, but it doesn't mean you are ready to teach others or engage in discussions with those who are in opposition to you. Persecution will come, and when it does, know that you're not alone. Expect to experience persecution for his name's sake. However, know that you will get through it and things do get better. Check out our video titled Persecution for a little encouragement in this area. If you must enter into a discussion or situation with a loved one that is hostile towards the Word of God, keep it light and brief. Everyone has something right and everyone has something wrong. We should be learning from one another, sharpening each other, not attacking, belittling, or berating. You can take what they say back to the Word and test it yourself. You never know. It may help you grow and become even more solidified in your own faith. But be careful not to spend all of your time testing out every theory that comes across your path. Never just accept them blindly, but not every theory is worth your time and efforts the moment you hear it. It's possible it's something you can test out later, but at that moment, the place that you're in, it may only serve as a distraction from what's most important. When you're just starting out, you're in sponge mode. Spend your time soaking up the Word of God, not doctrines of men or every new theory that comes your way. Now is the time to focus on the Father and His will. In His time, you will be ready, and He will lead you into the discussions you need to be in, not before. If and when you do engage others in a discussion related to the Torah, there are three things you absolutely must keep a tight rein on. Your attitudes, your words, and your actions. When you are careful in these three areas, your conversations are less likely to become hostile arguments and more likely to allow an exchange of information. But for that to happen, you must be able to keep the right attitude. Your attitude will stem from your perspective and your goals. When you keep the love of Yahweh and sharing His love as your perspective and goal, then you will better bear the fruits of the Spirit. They will be able to see the Creator in you and His love in you. You will be a vehicle of love and light to them. Loving your neighbor means keeping them in prayer, showing them love, and seeking the will of Yahweh for your life and theirs. Then, when your loved ones choose to either accept or reject the word, you will be able to remain at peace with them because your attitude comes from a place of love. How we live our lives is our witness to them. It's our representation of Yahweh to the world. When you find yourself in a conversation starting to drift away from being loving, take a deep breath and examine your attitude words, and your actions. Make sure your heart is right and then go back to common ground, the love of Yahweh and the Word, because where there is love, there is peace. We hope that this teaching has blessed you and has been of some help in navigating the life you now lead in following Torah. In a world hostile to the truth, the Word, it can be difficult to know what to say, how to say it, and to whom it should be said. 
When you have the chance, pray first that the Father is in the conversation and let the Holy Spirit guide you in it. Putting what we've said into action should help you maintain peace and love when a close friend or loved one in your life wants to discuss your beliefs. We know it has for us. May Yahweh bless you, keep you, and lead you in all that you do. We hope that you've enjoyed this teaching. Remember, continue to test everything. Shalom. One Nineteen Ministries has produced hundreds of biblical teachings, and now you can own all of them on one physical device. We are excited to announce that our entire video library in HD quality is now available on a flash drive. This drive can be plugged into your PC, phone, tablet, or anything else with a USB or USB-C port. The drive also contains written transcripts of our teachings for those who prefer to read rather than watch. Of course, we still offer all of our material for free at testeverything.net, but having a physical copy will allow you to watch our videos anywhere and anytime without the need for an internet connection. Having a physical copy will also ensure that our teachings are available if we are ever removed from video websites, which is a danger that ministries around the world are facing more and more. We want to continue to reach as many people as possible. Now, you might be asking, but what about all the new teachings released every week? Well, in addition to receiving all our past teachings, your purchase comes with free updates for life. Each flash drive comes with instructions that will allow you to easily download and store new teachings as they are released. Or mail us in the flash drive once a year, and we will update it for you and send it back at no charge to you. We hope you are blessed by this new resource. And as always, any proceeds our ministry receives goes right back into producing more teachings. Get your 119 flash drive today by going to 119flashdrive.com.